we did have a start and we went into executive session and now we're out so uh, we'll go into new business approve current expense note Sarah Haskins, town clerk and treasurer. Uh, so typically we get um, a tax anticipation note because we don't have a budget and we don't have a tax um, rate. We can't get a tax anticipation note, but we can get a current expense note, which is basically the same thing, different name. Uh, Tina and I met with the Union Bank, um, the representative that works with municipalities and with the Union Bank's attorney to ask questions and make sure that it was the same thing that we usually get and that they were able to offer what they usually do. And the attorney assured us that yes, um, it was the same thing. Um, so the Union Bank has offered us two um, types of loans we can get. One is um, a current expense note with an option for reinvestment <coughs> and one is just a line of credit. Um, my recommendation is to go to the one with um, the reinvestment option as we can make an estimated $25,000. If we do the line of credit, it will cost us $25,000. Um, this is something we do every year and last year the board made the Union Bank the sole source provider for this type of loan because um, how they calculate it cannot be matched by any of the other banks. So just to be clear, Sarah, if we did have a budget right now, we would be doing the same thing. We would be participation of taxes. Yes, it, it would just the loan would have a different name, um, and I confirmed the tax the tax rates and all of that are uh, the interest rates and all of that would be the same. The only difference is um, the name of the loan on our end. So the amount of money that we're we're borrowing is um, suggested two million one hundred eighty eighty. $48,800, right? Mm -hmm. And it's almost identical to what we borrowed last year. Tina for prepares- this, For what time period? Um, this would start July 1st, uh -huh. uh, 2023, and go through June 30th. Uh, Tina prepared a whole cash flow analysis. Um, there's a formula that we use yearly with the Union Bank in order to guesstimate what um, the amount to borrow. The Sarah, who would be to the um, I, I am the one that usually signs that as treasurer. I do, um, because they were the sole source and because of the timing, they need the paperwork back quickly. They have drafted up the paperwork. If you approve it, I do actually have the loan documents tonight for you to sign. Okay, good. Great. So you would need a motion. We need a motion. And... The motion would probably want that dollar amount in it. Um. Yeah, and um, option one that it's the the reinvestment option. Well, I'll make a motion to um, to approve the current expense with reinvestment option in uh, option number one in the amount of two million one hundred forty thousand dollars eight hundred dollars. I have a motion and a second. I'll second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passed. Thanks, Sarah. Number two, sign annual financial management questionnaire. Is that you? This is me again. That's why I didn't sit down. <laughs> um, so this is a form that I'm required to fill out a questionnaire by the state of Vermont. Um, as treasurer, it's just um, a form to for transparency to show um, so that the board is aware of um, the the um, financial management um, how how duties somewhat are divided between the treasurer and the finance department. Um, it's an annual form that I fill out every year, and there is no there have no, been no changes made since last year in in our practices and our policies. I would make a motion to uh, approve the financial management questionnaire and uh, authorize uh, Julie Bickford to sign on behalf of the select board. All second. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? 
I looked it over, it looks good. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. And motion has passed. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Number four, oh, sorry, number three, select bid for Duhamel Gravel Pit Phase 3 Hall Road Area Site Prep. Is Tyler on board? So our engineer Tyler is on uh, Zoom with us tonight. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Hi, Tyler. Hello. Tyler, you want to go uh, just explain to the citizens here the, the bid process and how we came to this? Yes, yeah, so this is for uh, the Jamble Gravel Pit. Um, as you're all aware, we've been going through a lengthy design and uh, permitting process, and um, we are working we can get that started. And so um, we started off as a conversation with uh, Eric and Kevin to start working on what is called the Hall Road area. So phase three, uh, which is up in the meadow, uh, consists of four areas that will be to have material to be extracted. Uh, but in order to get up there, we have to get a Hall Road to get up there. As part of the creation of the Hall Road, uh, there is uh, good material to be had in that area. And so the Hall Road itself essentially is a is a phase of the project. And so um, we initially started off this project by looking to um, hire a contractor to help with clearing and grubbing, as well as with uh, removing the overburden so that the town could get in and uh, work on extracting the material, sanding gravel. Um, it was a complicated process because um, extracting gravel is not super uh, straightforward. Step one, two, three, uh, you know, it takes, takes some figuring to figure out where you're gonna go and where you're gonna get your materials. And so as part of the bid process, um, in talking with the town and contractors, we decided that it made more sense um, both logistically and financially, the town uh, to revise the bid in order to simply have a contractor provide extraction services. So the bid was revised to simply include um, the extraction and production of both sand and crushed gravel to meet um, the needs of the town and the, the plan uh, of the Duhamel gravel pit as approved the permits. And so uh, that that is the RP that was uh, finalized and, and that's what was bid on by the contractors. And um, we had three bids received today. That is from uh, Dale E. Percy, um, also from GW Tatro, and also some from MSI. And I believe you have those results in front of you. Yes. So to recap the results, um, uh, GW Tatro offered $8 a cubic yard for the approximate 10,000 cubic yards of sand at 80,000, $10.65 per cubic yard for the 15,000 cubic yards of crushed gravel at 159,750 for a total of 239,750. Percy. Uh, offered at $5.64 per cubic yard for sand, $6.39 per cubic yard for gravel for a total price of $152,250. MSI came in at $14 per cubic yard for sand and $15.80 per cubic yard for gravel for a total cost uh, of $377,000. So these are unit prices for estimated quantities of sand and gravel. Um, and the total amount is, is equal to that. And uh, ideally we can get to that much. Uh, even if we don't use it, we can stockpile it. But that is uh, the 25,000 cubic yards is our, our limit uh, per year that's allowed to be extracted from the, from the pit. Uh, so we, we wanted to make a, a goal of being able to extract all that and understand what the price, the total price associated would be 
but also understand the cubic yard price would be. So that cubic yard price uh, for the sand and gravel includes the site contractors coming on site, performing clearing and grubbing uh, of the of the necessary area, not necessarily the entire the entire haul road area, but just the area that is needed to uh, extract that much gravel, as well as the the uh, clearing, uh, scraping, and stockpiling of overburden, um, and then also and then the extraction of the the sand and the fresh gravel uh, to the point that it would be thrown in the back of the uh, trucks of the town and um, and used. So um, we had discussed, we had a pre-bid site meeting uh, with those contractors and others uh, and discussed a lot of this. Also had conversations with the various site contractors. I feel that they all understand the project thoroughly, comprehensively. And I believe that those three bids are complete bids uh, and acceptable. And um, I think the results are, are fairly clear. Uh, Percy came in the lowest. It'd be my recommendation to go with them. Uh, they have a lot of experience in this, this realm uh, and they have the equipment and the know-how to, to get it done. And, uh, so that, that'd be my recommendation. Uh, but obviously, maybe you guys have questions and happy to answer that. Uh, let me know. Okay. Any questions? No. It seems pretty straightforward. Chris, Don? No, I think it's clear, clear choices. Okay. Could I entertain a motion? <clears throat> I'd make a motion to accept the bid put forward by Percy for uh, four, 564 a cubic yard uh, for sand and 639 a cubic yard for gravel. You want to do a total? For a total, a total of $152,250. I would second that. Got a motion and a second. Any discussion? I guess the only thing I would add is, Tyler, correct me, or maybe there's somebody in the audience that can correct me, but 10,000 yards of sand and 15,000 yards of gravel should exceed what we need in a year. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. <laughs> that was, My Kevin voice Barrow in the back. Said yes. <laughs> Kevin said yes. Go ahead. Please introduce yourself. Uh, James Brewster. Um, two questions. Um, the first, and maybe Kevin can answer this. Um, do you have you to dress up here, unfortunately. That's okay. Um, is there going to be an anticipated closure uh, of the mountain bike trails or the recreational trails uh, due to the new concept of not clearing the entire path up for the Hall Road? I will defer. So the, the estimated uh, yardage that lies between the larger meadow, the larger area of the mining operation, and the old phase one, the haul road, is about 127,000 cubic yards of material. And we're allowed to mine 25,000 a year. So you're talking about five years before we get to the edge of the meadow. Uh, the trail crossing for the haul road is near the top toward the edge of the meadow. So the estimate would be three to four years of mining operations prior to us needing to uh, work around that, that crossing area, I think is uh, it's a slow enough progression. We'll be able to work with the bike community to alter the trail, maybe up closer to the meadow for the time being until that area can be mined where it does cross and then build the crossing as we're supposed to and by permit, um, then moving the trail back down. But it won't, we don't anticipate it interrupting that trail other than just making a, a, a little uphill jog toward the meadow and then back down around. But this but this year there's no anticipation no. of clearing all the way up through? No. Uh, I think it was uh, clear to us that the need to clear based on the, the volume of gravel being excavated through that haul road area, it doesn't make sense to call all the way up to the meadow. It only makes sense to clear uh, the amount of material, underlying material that we need to fulfill the 25,000 yards. So it'll be a slower progression up through. And, and my second question is, um, obviously there's a very intricate Act 250 permit um, on this. Um, and I had asked the question last week um, of, of Mumley Engineering, um, what happens if someone finds that the contractor is in violation of the Act 250 permit? Ultimately, that's on us, the town. But what are the ramifications to the contractor? That can certainly be written into a contractual agreement with Mr. Percy 
Uh, yeah, that's something I also asked for was a draft agreement, which I have not seen. We don't have a draft agreement okay. yet. We had to do the bid, you know, accept the bid first. Uh, but that can be helped, you know, handled there. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I don't I'm, know how you do it, but I think there's got to be something yeah. in there that, you know, holds them liable for something if we, the town, default yeah. on our 250 permit. And we can look at uh, of the so. area towns. Uh, in this case, Percy's actually does the same operation for the town of Stowe in their gravel pit. Yeah. has to having to abide by their Act 250 permit. They also uh, recently, in the last year or so, purchased the former NATO sand and gravel in Johnson. They are familiar with working underneath their own Act 50 permit there. They're very uh, knowledgeable and aware of the ramifications of violating a permit. It's going to hit their bottom line as well. They have to cease operations because of a violation. They certainly don't want to do that. But yes, we can put some protections into our agreement. Yeah. We'll look and see what Stowe does. Yeah. Um, you know, it certainly. Uh, They've been doing it there for years. We'll, we'll see what they've written into their agreement. I think that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. I would just add, Jamie, you know, you're right. I mean, it is a very serious consideration for us, the uh, regulations that Act 250 put on us. And, mm -hmm. But, you know, Percy's been doing this for decades. Sure. And they're not new to the game. And, but I'm just saying that we, that we need great to do our due diligence to protect mm -hmm. ourselves at the town. Okay. Okay. Tony Cody, Cody Hill. I want to know when this gravel is going to hit the road after it gets extracted. Somebody should know. We've been waiting three years plus. It's terrible. We're taxpayers. We are not getting our money's worth. We you wonder why the budget is failing? This is why the budget is failing. Th this was out of our control. This was all under Act 250. We, Somebody lost town? a permit. I, I, me, I know talking, about that. Excuse me. I'm talking. And the town has done its due diligence in getting this permit in the process the way it's supposed to be. And the Act 250 process has not worked as it should have. And so we are paying the consequences. Our town is, taxpayers are paying the consequences, and we're doing the best we can to get the gravel out as soon as possible. So, so is there a date? I don't have a date. No. There's no way to predict the date. I no way. Say. Eric, you told me 18 months ago that the road was going to be built up on Cody Hill. And I'm always speaking for Cody Hill. Well, we're not. But there no, is roads in this town that are in Tony, disarray. Tony, you're, you're out of order. Please sit down. There's roads in this I, town please, that are disarray. We've, we've answered your question. This is about the permit. You didn't answer my question. We, we answered the best we could. Please have a seat. Thank you. OK, uh, any other discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 OK, motion is passed. <clears throat> Next is number four, discuss appointment of interim town administrator and compensation. As we have been uh, searching uh, for a replacement and have not and come up short uh, so far, we were looking for someone to sit in the seat interim. Much work has been done by our human resources director, Paula Beatty, in trying to find someone that uh, perhaps is a prior or retired town administrator, town manager, with the experience in order to guide us uh, during the period when the seat will be vacant. Um, that search has proven to not give us anyone in the very near future. My suggestion to the board had been uh, that we look, as we have in the past, to our chief of police. Uh, Jason Luno uh, has sat in my, in my stead when I was uh, out of state for a period of time. Uh, Jason has known all throughout the community for as many years of service to our community. Our employees, our department heads know him. Uh, he carries with him a trust uh, and a professionalism that uh, all recognize. Uh, so I had suggested to the board that uh, Jason Luno sit in as your interim. Um, the conditions of, the, uh, of his employment as far as the amount of hours it would consume of his day, uh, it, it would be a portion or a percentage of his day would be uh, to this. He'd be on call, uh, as it was discussed earlier. Uh, as to the compensation, I'll allow uh, Paula to come up and speak to that. I think we have a uh, we have a motion. Or would you like yeah. to come up and speak <laughs> to it? <laughs> well, Travis, go ahead and speak to it. Then. Isn't that an organized? Thing? Yeah, I mean, I I'll speak very briefly. Uh, I, I'll, I'll make a motion and then we can speak, I suppose. Uh, so I will make a motion that the select board appoint Chief Jason Luno as interim town administrator, effective July 1, 2023, 
with an added compensation of $500 per week to be effective in the first pay period of July 2023, to be paid as an interim stipend for the added workload, and that the select board compensate Judy Alberry, the administrative assistant, at an additional rate of $6 per hour effective with the first pay period in July 2023, to be paid as an interim stipend for the added administrative workload. I'll second that. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Yes, yeah, so I'll add just a little, a little background to where the numbers are coming from. Um, so in talking with Paula and talking with staff and talking with Chief Luno, um, you know, rough, and certainly this is a fluid situation, but rough, roughly anticipating about um, a quarter of the chief's time to be spent on these town administrator functions. Um, looking at the current town administrator salary, um, $500 a week is about a quarter of that. Um, that is where that figure is coming from. Um, certainly Judy as the administrative assistant is going to take on significantly more administrative workload, significantly more day-to-day -day work. Um, so sort of looking at you know various buckets here, Chief Luna will be the interim town administrator. He'll be handling a lot of the high level type day-to-day -day decision making, but Judy certainly will be taking on a lot of the day-to-day -day administrative functions, the things that come across the desk every day that still need to move. Um, so six dollars per hour, you know, equates. We did hourly for for Judy because she is an hourly employee. Chief Luno is an exempt employee. Um, but six dollars per hour equates to about two fifty a week, which is about half of what the chief um, is proposed to get here with this motion. Uh, well, if anyone else wants to add anything to that, yeah, I just add. Thank you, Travis. Um, I agree with what you said, and I would just say, Travis mentioned a quarter of his time approximately is going to be in this position, okay. but. Jason's still going to have all of his regular duties as well. Uh, it's not like he's not going to be spending those, getting you know, the duties done as the chief. Uh, Jason, in my opinion, is a very well-respected member of this, um, or an employee in this town. He's well-respected by the, uh, the other uh, employees in this town. He's clearly a smart person. He can problem solve. and. Uh, and he's a good listener, so I think he's very well uh, suited to take on this role. In the case of uh, uh, Judy uh, Alberry, she's already taken on an awful lot of responsibilities in this town. The past people and past individuals in her position haven't been doing it. And uh, clearly with Eric not around, she is going to be uh, inundated, might be a good word, but certainly very busy with added responsibilities um, in, uh, in just running that office. So. And did you want to speak to maybe the one of the select board members will be working with Jason too? Yeah, and when we when we did discuss this, we we talked about we spoke about the we spoke about the need for there to be obviously an interim town administrator to help Judy with some of the um, decisions and work that needs to be done. Clearly some of those decisions are going to be brought here to the select board. Clearly some of those decisions are going to be made by department heads. But um, the reason that we're doing this is we need somebody here on a daily basis to, to kind of help with that, that in, in between spot. On top of that, it seemed very uh, prudent of us to make sure that we had a select board member that would be available to uh, advise Jason, if need be, with the decisions that he's going to be making. And um, so one of us will step into that position and make ourselves available. And, um, and Chris is going to Chris is going to step into that. So well, we are going to co-op that. <laughs> I'll talk to my wife. <laughs> I have to talk to mine too. You know, the, the purpose of having somebody uh, from the select board, and I, and I understand, I, I am a, an appointed person to this board. I was not elected by the community. Um, I retired. Uh, Donna's uh, retired. Judy and the rest of the board have other obligations. Um, we think it's important that uh, there be point people uh, available for Jason to sound um, 
with on specific things. The point of having having the a select board member is not to be in a position of management necessarily, but a conduit to the rest of the board to help facilitate what, what goes on. Ultimately, it's a select board that's responsible for the, for the operation of the um, this, uh, municipality, certainly in the absence of a town administrator. Um, the select board needs to provide that leadership um, moving forward, and I think that's the intention of having people involved in that uh, in that availability and position. And I would just like to add that we've all made ourselves available, so we're all anticipating that we'll um, need to step in and help as needed um, with communication. And we should mention that there'll be a new email. Would you like to mention that? No, I don't think it's. No? Well, it's just a piece of the operational thing. We're going to create an email address uh, for the town administrator at morristownbt.org. Uh, that's simply uh, a place for my current email, uh, which is associated by name, to be forwarded to. And Julia's responsibilities will be to monitor that email for incoming traffic, uh, communicating with those sending the messages to try and uh, get that new email address out. And the, uh, the idea is the incoming uh, town administrator, town manager, whatever it turns out to be, will then use that non-name uh, email uh, going forward such that we don't have this kind of a transition period. So please don't email Jason. <laughs> That's what I was trying to get to. <laughs> uh, I'll just add to um, you know, the, the proposed motion here. These are interim stipends. The intent is that those will remain in place only until such time as the workload goes back to normal levels, um, you know, likely when we have a full-time town administrator in place. Um, and also point out that um, you know, between the two proposed stipends here, we're talking a little under 750 a week, um, which is significantly less than we would be spending if we were to hire an external interim. Paula, did you want to say anything? No, the only thing that I wanted to share was the involvement of the select board. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jan Paris. I'd just like to mention Point that up. if the chief is going to be doing his full-time job at 100% and 25% now as administrator, that we need to be really careful that he doesn't get into what's called job burnout. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Because if he gets burnt out and decides to do resignation 2.0, I mean, the trouble hasn't started yet. That's all. Yeah. Thank you. Well, that's something that's very concerning to us as well. Yeah. And it's yes. a conversation we've had with the chief, and certainly we plan to, to be very much in communication about that. It's yeah. definitely a concern. Because it, it all goes fine for a while, and then all yeah. of a sudden it goes downhill before anybody even knows what's happening. Thank you. That's a great comment. Thank it you. And we do yeah. plan to revisit this very soon. Yes. We're presently thinking of about a month from now. Uh, yes, Bob Wartry. Uh, I'd like to thank Jason for uh, stepping forward in this position. I think it will be a, uh, a big help to the town. My question really is, does that leave the police department understaffed uh, in any way. It's definitely going to take a couple of hours out of my day to be up here, but I will still be in town and able to respond to an emergency, which will take precedence over an you know, issue internally here. Okay. I think so far, yes. excuse me, Ed Lowenton, I'm also. I think the uh, decisions have been forthcoming and pretty good tonight. I think they're creative and well thought out uh, uh, solutions uh, in a temporary fashion. Uh, the idea of having a conduit uh, to the select board for Jason is on the surface, a good idea, but I'm concerned that given the spectrum of approaches and opinions in the board, I would rather see the conduit even handedly to all the members of the select board. I don't like the idea of appointing a member or choosing a member of the select board for this role. I would like to see full and equal, a, a study equal equality of access for all the members of the board to meet or and discuss periodically with Jason. 
Thank you. Thank you. And I will address that we did discuss this, and I have full faith that um, we we will all be communicating, and that while um, someone will be in the building, which more than likely is going to be these two gentlemen, it's we are all going to be very very actively involved and communicating. So there's no, again, as Chris stated, no one is stepping into the role solely. Okay. So we're aware of that. <laughs> We are. It'll be measured in terms of how much you all know yes. about what each other said yep. to Jason. Mm -hmm. If yes. it's totally open, that's fine. I have faith that it's going to be. And Ed, thank you for that comment. And I, I would just add that we are, I think many of the people in this room know this, we're each liaisons to different departments and we will be very involved <laughs> with our specific departments as well. I know I've, I'll be involved with uh, uh, the highway department, in fact, I met with Kevin and Matt earlier today, and we're going to get Derek involved in those conversations. So, so there's, the, there's that level of communication as well. So we have identified multiple places where Sounds people good. are going to yeah. be involved. And if you talk about your adventures with these different <clears throat> departments and discussions on front page four, you find probably a lot more support. It's not. It's it's mainly for this recording. Um, my question is: so, uh, is the search for an interim stopped? No. Okay. And is the uh, search for a permanent? Still, started, it's still going on. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So this is just a stopgap because an interim wasn't well found yeah. in the time frame that we all need. Because Eric leaves for three days. Correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The search Thank is you. still on. <laughs> Tell your friends. <laughs> so, no more questions. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And motion is passed. Okay, excellent. So number five, discuss executive assistant job description and rate of pay. We were going to have a motion? Yeah. Um, I will make a motion to table the discussion around the executive assistant job description and rate of pay. Do I have a second? A second. I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? What was that position? Come on up. Well, Jan Paris again. What was that position? I, I just heard about it the other day. I'm okay. We have, we have, um, I'll be, I'll let Paula take this one. Yes. That yes. She can do a better job. Thank you. Introduce yourself. Yes. Paula Beatty, Human uh, Resources Director. It was a restructure of the current position. So we were looking at the administrative assistant position and the responsibilities, the skill sets, and requirements, um, and we're just restructuring it into a higher level skill set for the duties that are actually being performed. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Go ahead, Tom. Introduce yourself, please. Introduce yourself quickly. I know they know, know you. Thanks. And who was we that brought this up on the agenda? To, to create a new position. Who was that? So she just addressed that, Tom. Sorry. What's the name? Paula Beatty, Human Resources Director. It is not a new position. It is a restructure of an existing position. Who's, was whose position? idea was that then? <laughs> Paula Beatty, Human Resources Director. It was um, a consensus of a group of individuals um, that worked with that position and determined that that was the direction that would be best for the town. Um, and so I guess the recommendation came from me. So if you're going to blame somebody, you can blame me. We're not blaming, no. Well, I, that's I was my recommendation, Tom. <laughs> Sure. All right. What I would like to know is the names of the people who came up with this idea to put this on an agenda that had to come through you since you are 
Yeah. Right. Pa Paula just said where it came from. She said a group of people got together. I would like to know who the group is. Judy, that would be Eric Dodge, town administrator, as I am still the town administrator. It is still my role and function to bring ideas, suggestions to the board to deliberate on when we see that there is a, a more efficient function ongoing and a much more qualified skill set in place. The fact that the, we have been blessed with Judy's presence doesn't mean Judy's going to be here forever. And when, upon Judy leaving, we would like this position to continue to function at that higher level because it takes away the, some of the minutia that, that comes in every day that takes me away from the larger picture, the larger dollar item uh, issues that I have to deal with. I appreciate that. I still would like to know the names I, I think it's been repeated to you twice now. Paula, Paula and Eric have said those are that the two. those are the two people, yes. Not uh, the group of people who got together and she first stated. Just those two. That's all I want to know. Thank you. Paula Beatty, Human Resources Director. Um, the conversation was also discussed um, with the finance director. Um, so it wasn't just Eric and I, the three of us. Um, not to, and Tina, I don't know if you want to speak or not. Um, the finance director has been here for 18 years, so she has a, a long-term history with that position. Um, and I think the three of us were in agreement, and so I made the recommendation. Okay. Thank you. I, I guess I just want to say, I mean, clearly we can wonder who was behind this. There's not a, I, 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 don't, I don't think there's anything um, nefarious going on here but the question is more rather why and the reason why is because as I alluded to before this job has changed a lot over the course of the last 12 to 18 months and the person that's in this job has taken on many more responsibilities than that person has been involved in in the past so I'd just like to really focus it on the, the why this is happening and I think for people that have been in this building a lot in the last 12 to 18 months, they know that that is in fact the case, that, that the job has changed. It's not the same job that it used to be. Well, that's really nice. Excuse me, Tom, excuse me, excuse Tom, excuse me, please no. Go ahead, Tina. Gonna, oops, so I want to give you a little bit of background. Tell me who you are first. Oh, sorry, Tina, Sweet Finance Director. I've been here for a long time, and I've been here through two administrative assistants that were the administrative assistant to the town administrator. Those ladies would basically do the agendas, do the minutes, and answer the phone. That's pretty much all they did. When uh, the position became open, we all met and we tried to write a new job description, but we didn't even know what the capability of that particular position could be because we had never had the higher level that we would have liked. So when Judy was hired, she had a a uh, very strong skill set that we had never experienced before. And she brought to that job, she handles all the computer stuff. She, I mean, all the contracts, all the phones. She got us phones, which saved the town a lot of money. She dealt with a lot of the uh, software to update the town and bring it into, you know, more, more user-friendly means like civic clerk. She's done a ton of things that never would have gotten done that are a lot higher level than what she was hired to do. And that is the reason that this position has been talked about, because it never was changed to reflect what her actual job duties are. Thank you, Tina. Tom, real quick, I'm gonna- uh, Go ahead, Travis. I'm gonna follow up on Travis what is on. said real quick, and just say this, is, this isn't a new proposal. This didn't come up just now. This was reflected in both FY24 budget proposals that have been voted on. Um, the board supported it both times, and I think I can speak for the entire board in saying that we're going to support it a third time. I would like to say that you just had a budget that was defeated pretty soundly, and by coming back at us, and you're gonna be adding a new position our, our restructured in new position is it going to cost us some more money. I would have to think twice before I did that. That's all I'm saying. I'm concerned about having this budget come up here soon. And if you're adding, adding or restructuring or whatever you call it, you people 
It just doesn't look good for another. So oh, well, that's all I'm saying. So Tom, you keep referring to this position as a new person. No, you keep referring to it as a new person in a new position. And and that's uh, misleading every time you say that. What 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 um, Judy brings to the table um, in terms of her workload and skill set is really ideal moving forward in the sense that we're currently looking for a new town administrator or a town manager, depending on where that goes. And contrary to some popular opinion on Front Porch Forum, a new administrator is not going to come with their own secretary. That doesn't happen. And furthermore, what makes the, the job even more appealing for a manager or an administrator is the fact that when they come into a municipality, what we want to pay them for is the big picture. So that they can begin to really take a look at what Morrisville's needs are. I highlighted the other day uh, at a meeting about our contract with um, the highway building uh, on the Old Creamery Road. We're paying up over $100,000 a year in rent. And over the last five years, we'll spend a half a million. And if we have to renew that contract again, we're going to be paying over a million dollars. We need somebody that can be taking a much more global look at those types of issues, uh, infrastructure issues, road issues, and leave the administrative piece, the uh, day-to-day um, uh, things that uh, a position that Judy now holds does, um, makes the whole community that much more efficient and productive. And all we're doing is by contemplating a, uh, a, an update on the job description is to really reflect the role and responsibility of regardless who's sitting in that seat. And, and, it's, and as far as we're concerned, um, these are, these, this is a necessary um, update on her job and it's also um, going to be reflected in a pay scale because to have somebody that can benefit the town manager and be in that position, um, the dollars are well spent. And, and we're going to have further discussion about this during the budget process, so there'll be plenty of time to vet this. Okay. Judy, may I get up and say something, please? Uh, let Tony know how you do. Tony, Tony, Tony Hill. First of all, why is it we don't have a town manager? And what's it going to take to get a town manager? Because I think a town manager could put a stop to a lot of this and, and probably could delete a lot of positions in this town. Yeah. I, I, I myself think there's a lot of positions in this town that are unneeded. With a good town manager, and you pay the town manager, Chris, what's Waterbury get? 130, 140, 150? 115,000 plus. Does, does Waterbury have the positions that we have in this town? They do. They do. They have a public works. I don't believe that. And I'm not calling you a liar, but I just don't believe it. <laughs> there's, four, there's 14 people that work in this building. There ain't 14 people that work in Waterbury building. I know that for a fact. They are all under one roof, but they are under a roof and they all are positions. And you can, you know, and, and maybe Waterbury's not the fair example, but there are similar right, population. Are there, right? Similar population. Similar population. Yeah. I mean, they have a recreation director that oversees a $700,000 budget. <coughs> I, I honestly think it's time for a town manager. That's and, my opinion. And I don't, think, I don't think anybody on I don't want to get out of order. That's, yeah. that's, it. that's okay. all I yeah. got. Right. I think we all agree on that. We have some views. Tell us Hello, who you are. I'm Judy Alberry. I'm the administrative assistant for Eric Dodge. Uh, I just want to say that I take pride in my work and I do a really good job. And I think up to, and Tina probably could speak to this, but I think up to today's date, I have saved the town more money than what my wages would have been with the race. So I am not costing you people more money. I'm saving you money because of my background. I was operations director for a multi-million dollar company. I come here with a lot of experience and I take pride in that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I have a hand up. Judy, can I, can I just remind you that the motion on the table 
yeah. is to table yeah. this agenda item. Yes. And we're getting way deep into the topic that we aren't supposed to be discussing. Yeah. It is being tabled. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder, Eric. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion is passed. All right. Moving on. Number five. Uh, we already did number five. Number six, discuss compensation for assistant. I'll make a motion to table that as well, given the fact that we sort of addressed that under number four. All right, excellent. I'll second that. Now I have a motion and a second. Any discussion? Seeing none. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion has passed. All right, number seven, discuss longevity pay policy. Who would like to start? Don't be bashful. <laughs> well, I, I'm, I'm glad to start uh, okay. the discussion. Okay, good. Um, uh, if you want a motion um, to begin I, this. I think that's a good idea. Yeah. Thank you. So I would make the motion to leave the longevity pay policy in place. I have one motion. Current, Do I have a the second? The version of the longevity pay I'll second it. I have a motion and a second open for discussion. So, so we, so, so we began um, this conversation uh, some time ago, uh, following the second defeat of the budget. And um, so, initially, uh, Travis and I got together in this room and took a look at the highway uh, contract. Um, because we wanted to see, because it's expiring as of June 30th, we wanted to take a look at um, what that means uh, in terms of whether um, it expired and, and they were not going to have uh, any cost of living increase or staff. Um, you know, really, where, where was that going to leave our employees? Um, what we've discovered uh, is that the highway contract stays in effect until a new contract is signed. So even though it expires on June 30th, uh, it remains in full uh, stead until a new contract is approved. So that means that uh, both the police will get their uh, COLA increase of 8.7%. The highway will get their COLA increase of 8.7% plus their staff as well. So really the only um, the only other folks that uh, are affected by the longevity pay policy is the non-union employees. So that would include department heads, like Jason, his deputy, it would affect uh, the uh, highway superintendent, his two foremans, EMS. And in, in the instance of the highway, if you take a look at their pay structure currently, if uh, we suspended this longevity pay policy, there would be workers in the highway department that could potentially, what well, would be making more money than their supervisor because they wouldn't be getting the COLA if we suspended this. And that was pointed out to me uh, several times over the last couple of weeks. And also, if you take a look at the actual dollars and cents in terms of what this would actually save the taxpayer if we suspended this, um, and try to either negotiate a lower COLA just for a certain segment of, the, of our employees. On a $500,000 uh, house, um, you'd be saving um, roughly around $30 on your tax bill. And I think that uh, what the message that uh, is clear to me is, is that um, we do not want to sacrifice a certain segment of our employees um, agreed upon, uh, hiring agreed upon, uh, uh, or an agreement between the municipality and when they were hired um, to save a couple of dollars on average home in Morrisville. I think that sends a terrible message to our employees. I think it's a terrible message for the community to send to their employees. It would affect uh, what? 18 people uh, across all of our employees. We employ 104 people between full-time, part-time, paid volunteers, and summer help. Um, I don't think that that's the community that we are. I don't think that's the community we want to be. And it, it's all about optics. So when people say, you need to cut the COLA, you need to cut pay, you know, we can't afford this. Well, 
quite frankly, for the few dollars that it's going to save on your tax bill, we can't afford not to stand up to our work. And we need to look at other avenues to push this budget forward, but we're not going to throw a certain segment of our employees under the bus to appease loud voices in this room on a front porch forum because they think that we're paying too much money because you know something? They don't know what it's really costing. All they're doing is throwing out percentages and saying, you know, this is far too much. There was far too much last year, far too much this year, and this is a cost of doing business. And the only business that we're in is service. And if you don't have employees, you don't get service. And, and that's just how I feel about it. That's why I uh, made it clear that I did not vote to suspend this. And I will let the rest of the board speak to it. I'll, and any other comments? I'll add, uh, again, I think I can speak for the rest of the board when I say that the pay structure needs to be looked at. Um, there's been talk of, of the tying directly to CPI and the volatility that that brings. It's volatile for staff as much as the town. When Cola sits at a half a percent, which it's done a lot, they get a half a percent. Um, when it sits at eight percent, they get eight percent, and the town has to absorb that volatility. I, I think personally, it makes more sense to implement a floor and a cap, um, whatever that may be. You put in a minimum cola, you put in a maximum cola. It's a win-win. It protects the town from that massive volatility when we see these crazy CPI spikes. It protects the employees from the low-end volatility when cola is at record lows, when it's sitting at zero or a half percent. Um, that needs to happen, and I think it's going to happen. We can't, you know, we've been asked to, to promise that we'll do that. And nobody can promise what will come through with bargaining. I think it needs to start with highway. The contract's up. You know, we need to talk to them. We need to explore what a new comp structure could look like. Um, and you know, whatever's agreed upon will be agreed upon through the bargaining process. Certainly, you know, the historical process has been that non-union mirrors the union. So if highway changes, then likely, again, I can't promise anything, but likely non-union would change with it. <clears throat> Police um, comes up in 2025, you know, that's, that's when their contract is expired. You know, I think it's not something we should rush. It's a process that needs to be looked at. I think it's a process this board will look at, but I think it needs to be done the right way. It needs to be done through bargaining. It needs to be done hand in hand with employees through, through the processes we have in place. So that's what I'll add to that. Thank you. I guess just a couple of things. Um, the idea of a floor and a cap, thank you for bringing that up. And we've all thought about it. I'm sure members of the, probably everyone in this room has thought about that. But that isn't where our contracts are right now. That's not where our police contract is. It's not where our highway department is, our highway contract, nor is it where our agreement with our non-union members are. That's not to say it's not going to change. Maybe it will. Maybe it should. But that's not where we are in June of 2023. We um, we have contracts in place with our with our union members. We have an agreement with our non-union members, and those are agreements and contracts. Most of those contracts are usually on a three-year basement basis. The uh, agreement with our non-union people goes back over employees, sorry, uh, goes back well over 10 years, 16. 16. And uh, we're just, we're living in unusual times. We've, we've had colas in the past that have been 0% and our employees <coughs> have gotten nothing in those years, nothing. We've had years when colas 1% or 2%. We've had two years in a row where our cola has been hot. Last year was, five, six, or two years ago, last year was 8.7. That's what we're living with. And we're all living with this. Our employees are living with this too. They pay all the same bills we do. They pay all the same taxes. They pay all the same rent that the rest of us pay. You gotta keep that in mind. I, I just wanna say um, the numbers that Chris threw out there, just to be clear. Yeah, you know, on a half million dollar house, I was shocked when I saw these numbers, a half million dollar house. If we pay our people, our employees, what we promise to pay them versus paying them about half of that, if we reduce their cola to five and a quarter, those of you that own a half million dollar house, 
You got 30 bucks in your pocket. I don't believe that. No. Well, we can show you the numbers, Tony. And if you want to come to the microphone and t talk to yeah, us in a second, you can. But let me just let me say what I need to say. 30 bucks. That's what it is. It's not a lot of money. I was shocked when we looked at it. But when you start adding it up, it's not that much money. As opposed to the morale issues you're going to create, where you take a police department that's very deserving of the money that they get. I don't think there's anybody in this room that would disagree. I'm very proud of our police department. I'm sure, I hope, all of you are. And they're getting those raises because they have their bills to pay. Our highway department, who I'm very proud of, that do all the things that they do. I have a neighbor of mine who, I promised I wouldn't mention their name. He's pretty involved with, pretty involved with roads, I'll just say, around the state. He said to me, you know, Don, it's only one time in my life I've never been able to drive up the road and get home. And he's lived here all his life. I'm proud of those guys, and they deserve the money that we have promised that they should get. Um, and contractually, we're bound to it. And then we have our non-union employees. And that's what we're talking about right now. The longevity pay policy relates to them. It's our promise to them. Do we pay them less because we can? And then we have two thirds of our employees in this town getting full raises and one third of our employees getting less. Is that what we want to do? Is that the town we want to be in? Is that the kind of situation that we want to create? That's a, that's a, that's a, a huge morality. Imagine working in a business where two thirds of the people are getting an increase and one third of the people aren't. Um, it's just, it doesn't make sense to me. And that's why, in my mind, I, I just have a hard time suspending this longevity, the longevity pay policy. I, I just, I can't do it. I can't, can't look at, and can't look at our non-union people who are working just as hard as the rest of them and doing all the services that are happening primarily in this building. Since I've come on this board, I've been, and I've said this multiple times, so I'm almost done, but um, I, I've just been impressed and impressed and impressed and impressed by the work that gets done under this roof for this town. So, Ed, can I say something? Yes, Ed, come on up. And she's going to speak okay. first. Yeah, I'm just, because uh, okay. um, this kind of came as a surprise to me because it's been in the conversation. And the reason we're discussing it tonight was basically our attorney told us we were on a timeline. Um, so it was an either or, it was an all or nothing um, tonight that had to be decided. The, as we all know, this has been in the conversations. I am a union person. Um, I understand union contracts. You can't just make a phone call and change it. That's not how it works. Um, what we've, what we know now very clearly is the highway to highway contract is coming up. Police, uh, is in two years. Um, again, we're living in unprecedented times. Um, this has never been an issue since 2008, this past two years. Um, you know, if unfortunately no one was, you know, it's caught all everybody off guard, everybody around the world. Um, and being able to predict this, we now understand that this can happen. So the plan that I'm thinking and what we have to do going forward and starting with highway is start rethinking. And that's what Travis uh, is talking about is that putting in some protections for the town also for stability for our employees um, so that there's a constant, uh, and that's, you know, oftentimes when I, the contracts I've negotiated and been in, it was, you know, it was about, you know, you knew for three, four years what you were going to get. Um, and again, so now we know that we'll put in some safeties that in case things go wild, 
um, that the employees will know. Um, unfortunately, we need time. Um, and I know the numbers can be scary. Um, there was an effort last year to, to um, kind of make things equitable because it hadn't been looked at it for so long. Um, you know, the, the compounded starts scaring everybody. But I do think the current reality is, is that, and what they're saying is to the only um, thing that we, the only possibility we could make tonight would basically be punitive to one single group. And that's, you know, um, that's the hard reality. And, and what that would do uh, at this late date I think financially, um, you know, we're we're talking. The, it's all in budget talks. We're looking at lots of other things, um, but I just want everybody to understand that that's what it comes down to: is that a single group of people would would be uh, basically uh, punished by if we made any kind of decision tonight, and that's where we are. Do, do introduce right. yourself again. Thank you. <clears throat> um, so where to start is... Tell us, tell us you. Edmonton. Thank you. As the discussion went on, more and more things popped into my head. Uh, it's just like whack a mole on rhetorical errors and factual problems. Um, this segment of the meeting would have been great if it had started out by a reading of the policy that you proposed to work with. Um, I've never fully understood it. it. It shouldn't take too long to, it should not have taken too long to read through it. And then a few questions about what it means. And I mean, you have an ever growing number of voters here who want to understand what you're doing. Sure. And I've said over and over and over again. Okay. I have it too. To the extent that you communicate better, you will find much smoother sailing in everything you're trying to do. And there's a start, it's on page four or whatever. All right, the second is, um, it's been really bugging me that there have been arguments about the budget in terms of how little or much it would cost the property taxpayer, that's a, that can, that's a confabulation, conflation. It's a specious argument. They do not belong in the same sentence. If you're discussing budgetary policies and especially compensation, what counts is to understand how that affects uh, the fiscal performance of the town and the performance of the employees. Retention of a whole lot of things, that's what belongs in the discussions. That's why it's important to know what the longevity policy says and to interpret it intelligently so we can all discuss it intelligently. I don't think that can be done at this point this evening. I don't think you, well, certainly spectators are not ready to hear that at this point, and I think that should be tabled. One thing, my rough understanding of it is, is it, it adds a certain amount of money to the pay scale every year just for being that, to me that is the very essence of static bureaucracy. You get paid just putting in your 30 years and getting your gold watch. I think that you sh if, if a segment of the workforce is relying on that, you can't just uh, abruptly withdraw it. On the other hand, you can probably do much better not to say that probably most towns are not doing the same thing, but this town doesn't have to be as mediocre as other towns. I'm saying that that should be a discussion in much more depth. What do you do? Are you committed to annual raises, or are there other principles on which you can reward employees? But Travis has pointed out twice that I've heard in these meetings that you don't want to encourage the union to step in and get active. I mean, if you read financial news all over the country, I mean, Starbucks, you know, you read financial news, it's not a good idea. So if, 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 if 
please somebody who's described the longevity pay policy. <coughs> It's, so, so thank, thank, thank you. Thank you Ed. Okay, but um, it's possible that it's not the absolute best way of doing things, and if that's the case, uh, it should be discussed more intelligently than we're doing so far. But the conflation of how much you're going to pay in taxes and and the budget, I mean, that's how the car salesman sells you into more bells and whistles. I'd have to disagree, but thank you, Ed. Thank you. It's, it's thank you. I'm going to take someone from the Zoom. Um, Would you all like me to take a brief crack at explaining? Go, the um, sure. As quickly and uh, as succinctly as you can. Just quick. I think it's fairly clear. So four hour. Oh, don't do uh, numbers. Just give a three to four. Okay. Yeah, but don't give numbers. The following longevity pay policy is adopted effective July 1, 2022. The longevity pay plan allows the full-time non-union employees to be placed on the scale by job title and step <clears throat> pending select board approval as I lose my voice. A new employee after a successful six months evaluation will increase one step. Effective with the first payroll paid in July, an employee will increase one step every year. The longevity pay plan will be adjusted annually utilizing the CPIW, Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers metric. For the months of July, August, and September, these months will be averaged and compared with the same months from the previous year to calculate the wage rate increase. There will be no caps applied to the calculated average. So that, that is the existing policy. <clears throat> so currently we have 20 steps right, per position. 25, 25. Yeah, it's 25 okay. So currently we have 25 steps per position. Those steps increase by cost of living based on that CPIW metric. So for this year, based on the policy, we're taking the CPIW metric, July, August, and September for 2022, averaging them. We're doing the same for 2021, averaging them, and we're computing the percent increase between the two. I hope that's accurate. <laughs> yes. Thank you. And that, that number is the 8.7 that has been floated out there. And that number in this policy is what will be used to increase each of the steps in the pay structure. Mm -hmm. So employees, if you're at step one, step one is going to go up 8.7. So you get that 8.7, but then you also move to step two, which is an additional 1.6% increase. So that, that is where these salary figures are currently coming from. Just to try to summarize the policy, I hope I did a good job. Tina and Paula, feel free to jump in. <laughs> Thank you. All right. We'll go to someone in Zoom, Kathy. Please identify yourself. Um, Kathy Chafee, and this is for Dawn. Um, uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, but when you guys talk about um, cost of living, um, there's years that they didn't receive anything or 1%. Um, some people look at that when you, when you just say there's years they didn't receive anything, but there's Every year they receive their step raise. Am I correct on that? Yes, yes. Okay, because it kind of, you don't really explain it like that. You, what, it, what it comes off as, there's years they don't receive anything. So I just wanted to clarify that. Yeah, you, you are correct okay. that employees do move up a step regardless of the, the COLA figure. Thank you. And, and Travis, just quick. So right now, if you don't, there's no cap on those steps. So uh, right now, everybody's receiving almost a little over 9% every year or whatever the COLA is. No. Just this year. No. Just, just this year. Yeah, but what about if the COLA is 8.7 next year? Then the same thing would happen. Um, but, the, you know, the board has, has talked about a, a, a min and a max, a floor and a cap to the pay scale. That's exactly why we're having those conversations. Okay. Yep. When Thank you. Go ahead, introduce yourself. Jason, on the police chief. But we have employees that are maxed out on steps. So their only adjustment of pay is the CPIW. And we also have part time employees that all they get is CPIW as well. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. So good. Not that's that's is good information. Good. Go ahead. I, I didn't see your hand up anymore. I thought you uh, would decide not to. <laughs> Sorry, Christy Snippers. I just want to say that um, I have looked ahead and projections for the um, COLA adjustment for next year are 3.1 or under. So I do feel like we're in a bubble of two years of a lot of volatility, but that's not something that we're trying to sustain. 
Correct. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, I can't see the next person. Uh, Nathan Bachman. Nathan, would you identify yourself, please? Nathan? Okay, I'll move on to Marianne. I think you muted yourself, Marianne. Yeah, Marianne's muted. Marianne, you're mu there you are. We can't okay. hear you. you. Got me? That's good. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to chime in about the compensation plan and I'll make it quick. Years ago, when I was the town clerk and treasurer, we didn't have a compensation plan. And so we worked on creating one so that there was some fairness to who got paid. And that fairness led to um, evaluations. It, it, it led to CPIU. Um, and there were the steps. And like everything else in this whole world, it needs to be adjusted and I, it's not been adjusted for a while and I, I've heard that you know the first five steps were thrown out or, or whatever that is but Travis is on the right track with caps on the CPI um, there are longevity steps there are you know qualifications and steps uh, and that's all meaningful but there really is a factor to be considered with caps uh, to keep things even. Um, over the years that you know I was there, yes, we did do the CPIU, but not everybody got it. And so the the compensation plan is meant to be a fair process for employee compensation. And I'm glad you're addressing it. I'm glad you're gonna rework it and it'll be to everyone's benefit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Tony? <clears throat> Tony, Cody, Cody Hill. So everybody should be smiling in this room. I don't see any smiles, so I'm gonna make everybody smile. Chris and Don, you said my taxes were gonna go up 30 bucks. No, we still gonna go down, well, yeah, it'd be a $30 difference. I want to make sure this is right now because people are listening. So I have half a million dollar house. Half a million dollar house. Start it up. If I bet you we right now the raise. I bet you, I bet the two of you right now that if mine are not if mine are under ninety nine dollars increase, I'll pay it. If it's over ninety nine, you pay everything else. <laughs> well, come on, laugh, people. Yeah. Why not? You, you, you're you're advertising this. Come on. And if it's over $99, you pay. Don't want to do it, right? I don't blame you. Just uh, one more. We got people. I'm going to back and forth, zoom in here, zoom in here. Um, Kristen or Kirsten? Kristen. Kristen? Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, I'm Kristen Fogdahl. I live on Jersey Way. And I just wanted to um, ask a quick factual question and then I just wanted to say something else. If there are employees that have maxed out on the steps, does that mean that there was a prior policy in place prior to 2022 that enacted the steps that's different from the longevity current policy? Not for police. I, I believe the non-union longevity policy that I read was amended in 2022. I would ask Eric or Paul because I wasn't here to speak to what those amendments were. I don't believe it was dramatically different. Maybe it was just uh, the shifting of the step structure. Can you speak to that a little bit, Eric? The, the previous uh, scale spoke to a step in pay grade. Tina, am I right there? It was, it was like a classification. It didn't. It, it didn't fit where we were with the scale we had because there was no pay wage grade six and, and it was the language itself that was didn't fit what we had on our scale so we changed out that wage grade language and simply put in job classification and step that was the language change did it not go from 
uh, a 30-year cap to a 25-year cap? Yeah, it was structurally changed, yes. yes. We dropped it down to a 25-year cap, yes. But Jason the, was, oh, yeah, me. what Jason was speaking to, we have, we have a couple of very long-term employees right. at the police department who are at the top of the current wage scale. They will not receive a step grade the rest of their career, however, however long that may be. They will only receive the CPIW adjustment to the scale. So am I correct in saying that the highway police and our non-union are now all at 25? Is that correct? 25 steps. 25 steps? steps. steps. Yeah. Um, no. Police no. is 20. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the highway? Union, union side of the police are 20. The union. Non-union as well. And Kevin, what, do we know what okay. the highway? Are they 25? From? Yeah. Okay, they're 25. Okay, just so everybody knows what we're at. Currently are. What happened with negotiations? Okay. The retirements for the two are much different. The right. highway department's retirement full retirement is considered 30 years of service. The police department, uh, along with other emergency services, um, are a 20-year retirement plan. It's all within the Vermont Municipal Employees Retirement System. They are just geared differently for the different occupations. Police does typically have a longer career, not a longer, a shorter, shorter career longevity. Um, in, back to the original question, the policy was amended, <clears throat> my voice. In July of 2022, but we have had a seven cola day structure for a significant period. 20 of time. since 2006. Oh, thank you for that clarification. Yeah. You're welcome. And in addition, I just I wanted to say that um, for the for what it's worth, I'm in favor of keeping the pay policy in place at the present time. That I also agree that treating all employees in the same manner is very very important. Um, I would also say that I'm very relieved and happy to hear Travis say what he had to say, because I do think even though we have an obligation, it doesn't mean that it's necessarily the right obligation to have if our policy has a weakness and exposes the town to this kind of volatility. So um, what I'm hearing from the board is that you plan to address that really soon, and that's really, really good news. Um, what I would also say is that what might help at this point, um, to the extent that it's possible, would be for the select board to recognize that um, for this interim period of time, what it means is that there may be other portions of the budget that need to um, have some sort of austerity measure um, to not simply say, um, you know, we have this obligation and so there's nothing we can do. We need to continue to move forward with all our other expenses as well. Since this is an unusual time, it may mean that additional cuts may be made in, in other places for a temporary time so that we don't just say, oh, well, it's business as usual. Um, I think that would be helpful and would go a long way. Thank you. Did someone else have it? How has it spoken? Yeah. My name is Juana Paris. I live here in Morrisville. I was a government employee all my life. We had five steps, and when you hired on at whatever the wage is, step one was six months, step two was a year, step three was two years, two years, two years. Then at that point, like Chief said, you're tapped out, and the only thing that you can look for, either get a, a, a better job in that department, like, you know, like being a lead man, per se, or the cost of living. But every person that starts knows that you know when two years comes up for my third my third price, everybody knows what they're going to receive, and then then it's just the cost of living. And if you if you like your job and you stay in the job for 20 years, well then you know after six years the only thing you can look forward to is the cost of living, or become a become a detective or something that pays more in that department. Thank you, uh, Tyler. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. So, once again, you've caught me while I'm cooking, so bear with me here in the background if you hear my son or something. But um, I just wanted to write, uh, just to, to talk about a little bit, again, my experience, you know, being a municipal employee in another municipality. You know, we're facing the same challenges no matter what municipality you're in. And I, I agree with not messing with the the cost of living increase for the current employees, but I do think it's a good idea to look at 
whether or not that is sustainable in the long run. But we do have to be careful, like, right, you know, the labor market is tight no matter what market that you're in. And the amount of money it may cost you to replace the employees you lose by not paying them those COLA raises, those raises, especially if they've been expecting them, will probably be more than what the actual raises were in the first place. Not only that, you have the loss of institutional knowledge that those people have that even if you hire in somebody, you're probably not going to hire them for less than what it would have cost to keep them. And they're not going to know the town as well as the employees that you currently have. So I'd encourage everybody to kind of bear that in mind. Now, whenever you look at look at this, that if you're not, you know, if we're we have to be willing to accept that if we're not willing to kind of pay that, there are other municipalities that may, and you have to compare like things to like things. And my question was, have we ever done a wage study for Morrisville to see where we rate as terms of municipalities of a similar size? We, I think that yeah, we do have some data on that. We don't have it right here with us, but we do. Not not by a consulting firm, Tyler. If that's what you're alluding to. Yeah, the, yeah, town Richmond, the town of Richmond did that, and what it was—I think it was really helpful because when I—and I don't mind sharing this—when I initially started, I was paid for a zoning administrator around roughly twenty twenty dollars an hour, and that's went up to twenty five ninety seven basically because they realized that for municipalities of their of our size, Richmond was underpaying its employees by about five percent. And we have we had the same issues that Morrisville had with retention, especially in the police department. Right now, Richmond doesn't have a police department effectively. All the members have resigned or taken positions with other towns or were able to pay them. And you know, we currently have six police cruisers sitting in a parking lot, and we have you know Heinsberg and stuff is providing police coverage for the town. So I would just encourage everybody to bear that in mind is that yes, I know it's not like the public and sector employees and I worked in as a public as a, in the private sector for many, many years. So I'm, I'm aware of the stagnation in wages there as well, but you have to compare like things. To like things. So we just need to, I do think it would be helpful for the town to consider doing a comprehensive wage study, you know, with a consultant so that we actually know what the facts are in terms of where we actually stack up to, compared to municipalities of a similar size, but thank you. Definitely take it under advisement once we have a budget. Thanks. Um, anyone else? Hands up. Go ahead. Yes. Jamie Jarrett, I just want to add here that it's not us against the employees here. Okay, it's bad decisions that were made yeah. previously that put this community in the turmoil that we're in today, okay? This is why budget has failed twice. I understand the fact that you're, we're obligated contractually, but again, it's based on poor decisions that were made in the past, and hopefully Travis is on the right course here. But again, it's not the community against the employees, it's the community against poor decisions that have been made. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think the, I'd have to, I'd have to respond to that is that the, the COLA, the longevity pay, the, um, I don't think you can call that a wrong decision. What happened is the economy went crazy. The CPIW was never this high since 2006. So it was something that was kind of out of the control of what we had, uh, the select board had originally um, made arrangements with the employees. That's where, the, that's where the fourth decision was made. Well, and possibly go ahead. Excuse, well. excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. You're out. Of, you're out of order, sir. You're out. You're, you're out of. You're, no, I was ans I was responding to you, and I. And, okay, you're out of order. Please sit down. Introduce yourself, please. Yes, my name is Tom. You can be talking about all these wages and how you're going to pay for them, and and I'll. I'll we're not against paying out uh, people. What you've got to concentrate on after this meeting is how you're going to talk to the people who are paying for these wages, the people that have refused your budget twice in a row, 
outrageously refuse your budgets. So if you want to pay that, that's good. I understand you have to do that. But you've got to understand, too, you're forgetting about the 1,003 people that voted against your budget. They can't afford to do this. So how, with your 35, whatever money it is, you have people that are worried about losing their homes. There are people out there. You got people on fixed incomes. 20% of this town is over the age of 65. Most of them fixed incomes. They can't afford it. Whether it's right, whether you can justify it all day long, they can't afford it. Somehow, this board has got to get together and get a budget that fits everybody. And those people that voted no somehow have got to be convinced that it's right and that they can afford it. And the only way to do that is to lower this budget. Thank you. Tina's Tina's going to speak. Tina's going to Tina's going to speak first. Tina Sweet Finance Director. I just want to clarify something. This whole CPIW thing, when it originally started, it is the Social Security cost of living, which half of the United States gets. It's not this arbitrary figure. It was based on Social Security's cost of living. So that's exactly what it is. Right, for people in Thank poverty, you. not uh, people that make $75,000 a year. Tony, we're not having a conversation back and forth. Please. I'm just Thank saying you. that it is the Social Security cost of living. In Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Julia? Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Can you tell us um, who you are? We only see your first yeah. name. Yes, thank you. Um, Julia Campagna, Morristown. Um, I, I'm happy to hear the discussion tonight and that I applaud the select board's creativity in trying to address um, the, the avenue you've taken for the interim position, trying to look at restructuring within. I think there are cost savings to be found. And I echo the other sent sentiments that we are in unprecedented conditions, circumstances, economically, and otherwise that are going to affect us this year, next year, possibly the year after. Um, one thing I want a point of clarity in this, because you've, at, you've said that the board is discussing restructuring within policies and reneg renegotiating contracts. As an attorney, I can tell you that the longevity uh, agreement that you have is a policy. It's not a binding contract. So renegotiating that shouldn't be as heavy of a lift as, say, union negotiations. Um, that being said, I applaud the suggestions that Travis has put forward that you're going to discuss and look at. And uh, the gentleman who spoke about the government caps that um, he worked in as a as a profession and the police have worked in as a profession where you can cap out um, and then you know what to expect. Those are all things to take a good hard look at. And I would ask because to some people's points tonight that it does come down to the bottom line and what can the voters really afford in their pocket? What can they what can they approve? Could you be as creative as you're being in this interim period with finding places where you can tighten the belt and, and hold fast on other areas and ride out this bump in this economic bump and this economic spike by foregoing perhaps some expenditures by cutting back on some things that are not absolute necessary um, expenditures that there is some discretionary spending power on and get us over this hump and get us on track um, to a budget that is sustainable or um, at least tolerable by the voters. And I know I see um, at times when people have spoken, there's been some eye rolling about people losing their homes. I will tell you for a fact that my mother-in-law, Agnes Jewett, would have lost her home over the initial proposed 30% budget increase over the last budget increase at 13%. She lived in her home for 50 years. 
She was on a fixed income. Her social security income was less than $700 a month. And the woman would not have transitioned well to any other type of living arrangement due to her mental health. That is a real factor. She was not alone. There's a community of elderly people, disabled people, fixed income people, who this is not tenable um, unless we find a better path forward where we can all cinch our belts in, suck it up for a little while, forego other things, other discretionary things, and get over this hurdle where we're a, a manageable budget going forward for all citizens in the community. Thank you. Thank you. Could I, could I just? Yeah, go ahead, Chris. So Julia, um, I think that uh, what you said tonight is really important. Um, this is the, the pay piece of this of this budget is just one part of what we're ultimately going to be discussing. And I don't think that it's lost on any of the five of us uh, what the vote was on this last budget. It went down two to one. We clearly understand that there's concerns about overall expenditures. The, the task that this board has is that the balance between cutting this budget more um, and then looking at what the, you know, the, the consequences are down the road. And that's going to be the balance of what we're going to be looking at over the next month, is a uh, balance between want and need, um, but also um, what's in the best interest of the municipality. And, and I'll share this with you. Um, there's two trucks uh, in the highway department that we were looking at, at purchasing, are looking at purchasing. One was delayed in the 2021 budget. Uh, one was uh, delayed last year. Those two trucks have gone up over $150,000 because of inflation and availability and, um, and supply chain issues. So those are real consequences to postponing decisions. So, you know, we are going to need to partner um, clearly with the community and the decisions that we make going moving forward. And I think that you have our commitment doing that. And we'll have a logical um, conversation about, you know, what we propose. Um, and if we, we um, um, eliminate other things within this budget to try to get it down to uh, 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 a place where the public can support. Um, we'll also make sure that as we make those decisions and you vote on this next budget, that you clearly understand what we're trying to achieve, but what also what we may be sacrificing <coughs> long term and what that relative cost will be. And that's, that's the task that this whole community is really looking at. Um, and I guess it's my hope, and I think the hope of the board, is, is that we can partner in this, um, sort of put down our differences and, and collaborate in a constructive way to put together something that we can all support and be proud of uh, moving forward. But thank you for your, for your uh, suggestions. Up. Uh, Remind us who you are. Bob Murphy, thank you. Uh, uh, I'd like to speak to what Julia had mentioned about her mother. This is something that really concerns me. First of all, you are not the bad guys. The employees are not the bad guys. Um, I admire you all greatly for what you are doing and the pressure and circumstances that you've been put in. All of you. Um, the bad guy, quite clearly, is Montpelier, honestly. The way that the state <coughs> Taxes is ridiculous. It should be income based, not property based. It's exactly what Julia talked about. We have numbers of families. They have no wealth. They have a home. It's been in their family for a hundred years. That's all they have. They have no way to pay the taxes that are due on those properties. If it were income based, the people that have a half a million, two million, three million dollar house, they have the financial wherewithal to pay the taxes. 
we, what Vermont is doing is really wrong. And we are one of only a couple of states in the country that do this. So my suggestion going forward, if you don't like what's going on here, talk to the people who are elected in Montpelier. That's where the change has to occur. Another example, coming down the road next year, $29 million for food for all in our schools. That's going to be on your tax bill next year. I, I support families that need help, absolutely. I would give them the shirt off my back. But somebody making $200,000 a year, free food? Come on, what are we doing? This is what has to change. This is where the change has to take place. Our select board and our employees are dealing with the hand that they were given. The problem is the state. Write your representatives. Demand some change. That's what we need. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. I do want to be sure. Oh, those are good, good points. I just want to be sure we're staying on the agenda. I think we're, we're, we're straying. A little a stray. Yeah. So we have a uh, discussing longevity pay. I think we have a motion of floor yes, we do. table and we have a second and I think uh, we're ready to vote um, all those in favor aye. Aye. aye any opposition okay motion is passed so the longevity uh, pay policy stays in place number eight discuss scheduling budget meetings and election okay is this is this a Sarah question no a, a little bit sarah, sarah and i have discussed uh the, the, the logistics around election dates because everything really hinges upon that date and then the preliminary 40 days of the window then which sarah and her team have to work right uh, very quickly so you want to speak just reintroduce yourself too please Sarah Haskins, Town Park and Treasurer. I don't really have anything prepared because I'm not sure what the board is thinking, but I'm here to answer questions um, with timelines and um, tax as both Town Clerk running the election and as Treasurer collecting tax uh, and taxes. Um, I've had a lot of uh, conversations with elections. I've had a lot of um, conversations with the LCT getting information, but I don't know exactly what what you need to know or what questions you want. So How you want to start this? My number one question right now is around tax bills, the November 15th tax bill is coming. What, you know, what would be in your mind sort of the absolute drop dead date to have a budget approved, to get a tax rate set, to get bills out as normal for that November 15th installment? So um, tax bills, the voters voted on November 15th. The default is 30 days after tax bills are mailed. I'm guessing I need at least a week, 10 days, uh, two weeks best to process um, the tax bills and, um, uh, and and mail them out, physically stuff the tax bills and mail them out. So if you back up November 15th, that would be October 15th, about October 1st is when I need um, a tax rate to be set in order to uh, hit the November 15th deadline. So then if you back that up, um, I confirmed with VLCT today, um, they strongly recommend, even though it's not in law, that we um, wait a 30-day appeal from the election. So that backs you up till September 1st. So um, that would be the drop dead or um, August 31st would be pretty much the drop dead day for an election in order to hit the targets to meet the November 15th deadline. Okay, which that, would, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, go ahead. That being said, I asked what happens if we don't make that deadline. Um, the deadline for the November installment of taxes that we're used to becomes 30 days after we mail out tax bills. The May 15th deadline deadline for the second installment stays in fact assuming we have a budget and Sarah what's the the timeline if um, the elections on the 31st we have to have 
40 days between, 30, right? 30 to 40. 30 to 40. Oh. So that means that. Um, Sir, you want to use it on a Tuesday? I don't mean to interrupt, but yeah, so typically, the 29th so on, is a Tuesday. Um, typically, elections are on Tuesday. So it would have to be the 29th. The 29th or the 22nd um, of August. Before. Yeah. <clears throat> oh, absolute deadlines. Yeah. Okay, so the, if uh, August 29th, so then we have to go back 40 days. So that, so I calculated that. So, um, oh, gosh, um, if you did the 29th, it um, would be July 20th. You would have to have a special election that Thursday night to set up um, uh, to, to do the warning. If you did um, the 22nd, you could warn it at your regularly scheduled meeting on that Monday. Uh, 17th. The 17th. Um, July 17th, you would have to have a special. So. Meeting. If we like, if, if we did it on July 17th, then we could have the election still on the 29th. Yeah. Um, no. 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 You have to have the election on the 22nd. 22nd. All right. It just seems the 29th seems to be a better date because we know the kids are in school, and just people are, are back from vacation and so on. Do we, do we, do we have have it on Tuesday, do you, or is that just the norm? Elections are always on Tuesdays, but it doesn't yeah. have to be. So your suggestion, possibly Judy doing the 29th to <clears throat> give us a few more days, is that what your suggestion? Well, yeah, because the public, mm -hmm. kids will be in school, public, mm -hmm. most people are back Understood. from vacation, and it's not like it's the week of the 22nd, it's kind of iffy. <laughs> I don't know when the date of school is going to start. Oh. Sure off, yeah. yeah. And we're talking about the 28th. September 28th, yeah. So September 29th is a Friday. No, August. 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 Oh, August. Thank you. I was like, wait a minute. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, and just um, so you know, I, I've also been, um, I put out bids to ask um, mailing houses about mailing all the ballots for me. That's what the larger towns are doing. And talk, I had a, I was appointed to the Secretary of State's Advisory Committee. Um, there's 12 of us from the state that meet monthly with the Secretary of State. This um, week, this month was elections, so one of the elections administrators was there. We talked all things elections. They're surprised that um, a town of our size is um, not doing, not mailing them out. Of the four um, quotes I got back, um, one can't do it at all. One will be probably 1,500 less than we are doing it in the house, and one wow. is um, about the same, if not a little bit less. Um, wow. Less than what we're doing in the house. Yeah. Wow. So That's that amazing. Would, so um, I That's am going nice. to, I'm, I'm still talking with the two low bits <laughs> to make sure that it's, that it's really um, what we need, but that is, um, if it really is, and it will all work with the tabulator, and it's what elections has recommended, then that is what I think I'll do. That it'll free up some staff time that we can focus on wow. other things besides that elections that are being neglected. That's amazing. Are we allowed to issue tax bills without a tax rate set? No. We can't bill on last year's budget. No. Yeah. I thought that that was that had been my guess, and I got. Um, Clarification from BLCT that we cannot. Thank you. Okay. So it looks as if it's a really tight timeline. Very tight. Oh, really tight timeline. It is a really tight timeline. You know, to effectively partner in this thing um, and come up with uh, a budget that uh, we feel and the public feels that they can support. Um, we got one shot at this thing, mm -hmm. and I think that we need to take some time to do it. Um, yeah. I think that to think that we're going to pull this thing together in the next three weeks um, no. is unrealistic at best. Yeah. Um, so I think that we really need to take a hard look at at whether I know that um, you know you're factoring in the 30-day appeal period, um, but. Um, I, I think that we need the month of July to, to get through this and, and get enough public input and come to a consensus to make this thing work. How do you feel about that? <laughs> I'll tell you, I don't love either of the Iowa states. I would be sacrificing my vacation to have an election. But that's fine. I, it's my job. I, I will do it. But if, we if we're moving it up and saying we're not going to do any 
anything until the 1st of August to even set a date. I mean, to approve the budget. Right? That's what you're saying. Chris, I mean, we right? could push the election. To We're at the end of June right now. Yeah. Right. Um, and um, we, I think we've got a, a fair road to travel here in terms of uh, gathering uh, consensus and taking a hard look at this. Um, I, don't, I don't see it happening in three weeks. No. To, to make that deadline. So if we have to push the envelope a little bit in terms of the appeal period, and I think that we take the month of July and maybe warn something in the beginning of August and see where those dates come so that we have a, a, a vote in early September. Looks like August 7th would be the first Monday in August, which would um, be a regular monthly five, meeting. Yeah, there's five days in a week. Whenever. Yeah, but that's an option to look at. Yeah, honestly, I've only looked at dates of, um, going to try and get it before November 15th. I haven't looked further at what the dates would fall. How detrimental of an impact is it on the town if we have the, the tax bill deadline changed to say December 15th? Is that, are we gonna have sufficient revenue? Is the, the loan We've we done just the, the loan was based on um, cash flow coming in in November. I don't know, can you do that? <laughs> I, it, yes, it was done based on our cash flow from prior years. Um, that being said, I mean, I don't know that it will matter all that much because we get the um, entire anticipation, tax anticipation note ahead of time. So if we had to take more money out of it, it probably would just mean we wouldn't collect as much interest at the end of the year. All right. Thank, thank you. you. So you need, when do you need a decision? Not tonight. I, I don't. I don't really have an answer. We have a meeting July third, right? Do we begin no. budget conversations on July third and talk a more firm election timeline? Um, I'd rather not do the third. I won't be here. But but the, the setting the date can be fine. But we can do a meeting that week. Yeah, we're, we can do a meeting that week. We could do we, a meeting we on could, the sixth. I'm, I'm on vacation the rest of that week. I'm, I'm working the third and we're leaving the fourth. Well, no, we're leaving the fifth, actually. But I'm out of town that Wednesday to Sunday. Okay. So you I don't want to roll the election like you guys say. I, it's just, I'm sorry, I need about 100 days. So 100 days. 100, 100, um, 100 days from, I think, is what I calculated to warn the meeting and collect taxes. Tax okay. So, so we're going to need four meetings in July, it looks like. Two regular select board meetings and then two de dedicated to budgets. Yeah. yeah. And nobody's, I know this is, I'm going to throw it out there anyway. Any chance we can meet this week at, like, Thursday? I'm just really getting nervous because it's a big hall we're going into here. Just throwing that out there. I, yeah. I'm, I would prefer to get started sooner than later, but I don't have a Just budget talks only. Yeah. 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 I can do Thursday. I could do Thursday. Just because everybody's going on vacation. I so. could do Thursday. We can warn a special Two meeting. I, I know it's I not a good one, but I just am so worried about <laughs> can we, can wait, one second, second, one second, please. We're having a discussion. Just wait, please. Just, I'm just please, just wait. Thursday might be good just to begin our discussion, mm -hmm. start laying out the issues so we can start to think about it. I kind of like this idea. I, I don't know how the other board members feel. The sooner but. we're getting, I'm available. I would like to do Thursday. And then bag the third. Like, no, 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 Come in and, and help somehow create a budget that they think 
everybody can be happy with. If you would allow these two people, who are well known in the community, well trusted, and knowledgeable about this, to assist you folks with this budget, I think it would make the community, when you came out with whatever the final budget was, feel a lot better about, and and it would increase the ability to get it passed. The, the discussion's going to be taking place in public. I know, but you, before this, I mean, you need some help on getting this budget together. And there's two people that have requested it time before to assist, give you some examples or some proposals before that you can be talking about. Well, there's really no reason in the world why they can't attend these oh, meetings. Okay. And, no, don't. I mean, there's no reason why they can't attend. Well, there's a lot of reasons. They were both on Zoom tonight. Yeah, yeah. they're on Zoom tonight. I'll say too, Tom, I've sat down with you, I've sat down with others. If anyone wants to reach out, I'm happy to sit down one on one and brainstorm proposals with anyone and you know potentially present things back to the board. I think all of the board's happy to talk to people about their proposals okay, and their thoughts. Just so that the community has a good input, that we feel comfortable with the group. We don't want to do this. Yeah. I, I would love everybody's side. Yeah. Everybody's side. But we have to have a budget that, that people can afford. That's all. I mean, that's all we're looking for. We're not looking to, 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 to cut people's salaries or wages. But, but we need something that people can pay. That's all. So uh, let those people that are on that, they get it. So maybe they'll say. I'm definitely yeah. happy to hear any proposals anyone yeah. in the public has. Yeah. I, I, mean, I really am. It's, well, we, 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 have, I want this budget to pass meeting. just as much. I know you can't all have a meeting together because the rules and stuff that we we'll sit down and, and discuss. I know we had some good, there was some good I've proposals. Spoken. I've, yeah. sh I've shared those proposals yeah. with the rest of the board, but, and I think they'll come up during budget for, discussions. What we're discussing is there was. I actually started some conversations and it basically came down to getting getting some people from very different demographics um, and a representation of a population and basically just getting everybody at the same table and saying, you know, what's it going to take to pass this budget and hearing directly from them, you know, what their concerns were and, uh, you know, we did come up with um, some ideas uh, and again it's a start it's so, just a start so we're so, fo we're focused on yeah. dates I don't think we've made a decision does anybody here feel like we've come to a decision on the dates yeah, well, we should Ju Thursday. Judy yeah, said the room is available on room Thursday, so, Thursday wanna... so Thursday okay this is coming Thursday okay yeah, so five special meeting. five thirty five thirty works for me and I would suggest the week of the third is a tough week it sounds like for a lot of people yeah, yeah. Are we going to have the but regular? The week of the tenth. Yeah. So the week, the week of the third is, we don't know what the agenda is going to be on, the first Monday in July. No. We don't know. So we can, we can have that meeting on. Uh, up, uh, I'm losing my train of thought. We can have that as proposed. A business meeting on the third, and if there isn't any business, that can then the meeting can be canceled. It's defied by that. There's always oh, business. There's business. <laughs> business. Okay, so we can still have the business meeting we can on have the a third. Nice short regular business meeting. Oh, I'm glad you're optimistic, <laughs> Travis. Okay, sorry, Sarah. Sarah Haskins, just um, when you're going through your Julys um, before you say the tenth, you all have a. Um, VLCT training yeah, yeah, yeah. about um, tax appeal assessments that VLCT. So don't schedule yourself a meeting because you have one. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Available to and I've emailed some folks about oh. that. Yeah, I am not either, but hopefully we'll get it. We can do a. a what's it? So we're Zoom. anticipating that we'll have the regular third. So we are going to have a regular meeting on the 3rd. On the 3rd, yes. yes. And we're going to have a regular one on the 17th then? I believe so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we're looking yeah. at the week of um, the 10th through the 14th for a second budget. How about the 13th, Thursday night? 
for a special meeting. There's a housing committee meeting that night. Are we still having I'm that? The twelfth. It was delayed for a bit. Um, I can't remember. Is Todd, are you still on? Yes, Todd, are we still having that meeting on um, July 13th, Housing Committee? You are scheduled to have a meeting that night, unless the report's not available. So as of right now, yes. Okay. It's a, a big report. We were waiting on yeah. some numbers so, before we had So if it's not, if the report isn't available, we won't have that meeting. Can, I wonder yeah, if we... Even if he has that meeting, it's not, it gets five. over with before. But we usually sure. was six, because it's usually an hour. You could check with Todd. Okay, so we could... We could do it at six. You're saying? Is that what you're saying? All right. Yeah, because it's supposed to be five o'clock and it's an hour. All right. Six o'clock. on the twentieth. Thirteenth, oh, I don't know. Confused. Oh, thirteenth. All right. Yeah. So thirteenth at six o'clock. Yes. And that's a strict budget. Just budget. Two. Well, I think that's good. I think we'll do. We'll do. We, we can do more, but I think that's a good start. Okay. Yes, I mean, Thursday we can start. even look at others, other dates. Um, oh, really? Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. James Brewster. So you're talking about this Thursday. Correct. Yes. So does that leave you enough time to warn that meeting? Yes. It does. Okay. 24 hours. 24. 24. 24. 24. Special, 24. special meeting is 24. 24. Right? I, thought yeah. the same. I thought emergency was 24. I thought emergency, I emergency was 24. Was 24. Yes. Special was 48. Yeah. 24. Yeah. What, is, what is it? 24? Do it tomorrow. Tuesday. All right. I just know enough time. There's still enough time. Yeah, more yeah. time. Sorry, Chris. That's Go ahead. Tell us who you are. I just have a question about what Laura said, which um, I thought we were supposed to come to the select board meetings to give our feedback on budget concerns. We, this was, yes, you will. This was just people had reached out to me, and I was curious, and it was literally hearing very specific things, no, no decisions or anything. It was just gathering of information and ideas. To, I mean, you know, in the interest of transparency, though, yes. like having side no. meetings like that. Is it's not, it wasn't a side meeting. It was just me with some individual people um, talking to get a clear uh, idea. And just like coffee chats, it was the same thing. Absolutely nothing, nothing can get decided. Everything gets decided here. It's just a matter of hearing directly why they voted no. So there's no. But the board has not had any meetings with no. the board outside of the board. No. Uh, it is 24 hours for special meetings. I just looked it up in the open meeting law guidelines. Okay. So, um, did we, do we have to vote? Do, we already figured this out. We don't have to do a vote or anything. We We're good. Okay. Other business? Yes. Oh, yes. David Ring. Before you move on from this uh, new business section, may I uh, request that you reopen item number three? There's questions and comments from what I've heard tonight talking. May well, I agree? You can ask a question, sure. Question. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, you said this, you selected the bid for the Hall Road site prep based upon, and it was Percy that you chose. Correct. It was based upon compared with costs of that. And there was the question asked of a timing factor. I would like another question answered. Is what that material sand we need all winter long gravel we need all long what does that cost us now i don't tina do you have any information on no. that well you said that percy gave you a bid for sand of 552 and gravel around that that's something. what he's going to excavate from the the pit he's going to he's going to excavate from the pit right yeah. but going to charge us that's the excavation cost from the pit. It's, right. it's a process of the It's a materials. process of doing it. But you don't, process. But you don't you get any of these contractors a timing to where we can actually get extraction from that. Sorry? You're, you're going to be pulling material out of the pit, correct, later on? That's the goal. That's yes. the goal. 
Yeah. This is, this is the permit allows us to operate the pit until I believe it's November 15th. So the, it, the contractor, November 15th is by permit to when we have to close the pit. So the contractor will have until that date in, in order to fulfill their obligation by contract. Kevin has some numbers, I believe, from, uh, if you want to come up to the microphone, Kevin? Last from our last meeting, um, Told I could go out to bid on our sand. So right now, from gravel construction, they're looking at 850 a yard, 11,000 square yard cubic yards is $93,500. We also got a bid from Selvis, Steve Selvis over here in Wolcott, and he came in at $8.96 per cubic yard. Same amount of yard as you're looking at this time. Just under $100,000, just for road sand. Not including gravel. I'm gonna have to bid for gravel. Last year it was ten dollars a year. And Percy's bid was five something, correct? Oh yeah. Yes, Percy's was five oh six for the sand and five sixty four for five, sand, six thirty nine for gravel. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And once we get, once we get that pit in operation, we can drop those numbers out because you'll be you'll be you getting your own. Is that correct? Yeah. I guess so. so. I'm not a I'm not a uh, crystal ball. There, my point though, is there any way you just chose a contractor? Is there any way you can put more of an emphasis on this person to get that fit where you could be using it to save money for the town? Well, that's the goal. I know. But <laughs> we we haven't been able to use the pit because of the Act 250 process Pre right. has prevented us from using the pit. Right. So now that's been resolved. Not yet. Okay. Not totally. We have permission to go into the pit, but we're still working on some issues with the Act 250 sure. permit. So they can't even begin like screening the overburden to get to the gravel yet, you're saying? I'm not, I'm not saying that at all. I don't know. There's a hearing on July 11th in Burlington, but our attorney's gonna attend with Todd. Right. Speaking to this. I'm just trying to figure out ways to, you got, you've got new people coming on board and one of the items that we spent a lot of money on is sand and gravel. Mm -hmm. And if we can somehow put these people onto the task of getting this uh, to save us money. Right. You know, it's, it's, I think, David, it's there's a possibility day. down the road, maybe a strong yeah. possibility, but at least a possibility that some one of these contractors might be processing sand and gravel in that pit for more than one year. And providing us a service that is going to not only, it'll save us money for sure. Well, not for sure, but might save us money. And that would make a lot of sense for, for them to be processing and for us to be using the sand and gravel that we own, but having somebody else, a private contractor come in and process it for us. Right. And allow us to get the projects done that we need to get down around town. Right, because then it just is there for you. Right. right. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, so um, any other business? Eric? Yes. It's an executive session possibility for legal issues. Okay, great. There is a motion. In the Somewhere. Motion. I did have one quick question. Okay. Um, what, is what, what happens if the, uh, if the town doesn't have a budget when the fiscal year expires? Good. Uh, it's, it's expiring at, in a few days and we're we are ha we're getting a loan from Union Bank. I think he means 24. If we go through oh, 24. 2024? Oh yeah, like if we don't have a budget going into and we kick in the new fiscal year kicks in, like how does that work? Do we just revert to 2023 spending? I or? My understanding is that there's not really a statute that touches on that. I think for the school districts, there is a statute that touches on reverting back to the prior yes. year's fiscal budget. But my understanding for municipalities is you vote until a budget passes. Yep. So, and the state wouldn't get involved in an imposed one then, correct? Not that we're aware of. No. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, go ahead. So I'll make a motion go into executive session because I find that premature general public knowledge of pending or probable civil, civil litigation or prosecution to which the public body is or maybe party will clearly place the town at a substantial disadvantage by disclosing its negotiation strategy. Second. I got a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. I move to go into 
executive session to discuss the pending or probable litigation or prosecution under the provisions of Title I, Section 313A1, other month statutes to include Town Administrator Eric Dodge. Second. Got a motion and a second. A discussion? No. Okay. Well, okay. Do you want to, you, you want to speak? Open that door. 